Um, while we're waiting, <laughs> I, I want everyone to take your little connections to the mothership and put it on silent. You don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything will be okay at the mothership without you. <laughs> Cabot, K-A-B-O-T, 
Zinn, Z-I-N-N. -N. Dr. John Cabot Zinn. He is at Harvard Medical School. He does counseling for cancer patients. And what he teaches cancer patients, this is so cool, what he teaches cancer patients is to be in the moment. Because most of them are going to die. When you're going to die, what are you worried about? The future? Yeah. Things that you did, the past, yeah. things that you did not get done, might left have unsaid. You're, you're, you're in two other places. And what Dr. Zinn teaches people, and he wrote a book, this is so good. The name of the book is Wherever You Are, Wherever You Are, Be There. And this is so important for you as physicians, because if you are there, and you are in the moment, and you're being there with the patient, they will feel that. This whole workshop today is about how that person is going to feel once you get done talking to them. Look at what I'm doing physically. I'm not standing up in there. I'm down and looking at you. This is a, you're gonna, um, there's a title for this, and we're going to learn about this. Now, on, the, uh, the, on page 53 of your book is my syllabus. I want to share this with you. Everybody wants to communicate for the purpose of me wanting you to understand me. Everyone. But there's a twist here. Everybody, fold your arms. Didn't even think about it. Either. Now do it the exact opposite. What do you want to do? Go back. Yes, you want to go back. And it's the same with folding your hands. When you fold your hands and there's one thumb on top, I want you to fold with the other thumb on top. What do you want to do? <laughs> go back. Today, you're going to learn some things that are going to be uncomfortable in a little way. And we always will want to go back to the way it's normal. Doctors... You are scientists first. You look at cause, effect, cause, effect. Blood gas, acidic, blood gas, alkaline. You do this, respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, two different treatments, but for the what goal? To get the same thing, to balance it. So you look at data and you apply the treatment. You look at data and you apply the treatment. Your patients, know that you do that, but what do you think they want from you? They want you to understand them first. And so our norm is to tell the patient or family all that we want to tell them so that they will understand. No, 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 no. If you do it the uncomfortable way, I want to know, learn about you. And we're going to talk about today about how to do that. But the first thing that you must become comfortable with is being uncomfortable in reversing things. So you want the other person, you want to understand them first. And then you worry about them understanding you. Because when they feel understood, then they will be receptive to everything that you, doctor, will tell them. Because it's easy to hide anybody, me too. It's easy behind data. Uh, your mother has got this lab work, uh, this x-ray, this, 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 this. Your mother is very sick. We are going to do a series of tests which will lead us to learn the best way to treat her. I know you must be worried. I know you must be frustrated. I know you must be sick. Over it. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about you. When I when I talk about that, I'm not talking about data. So first, understand the other person. Now, how do people interpret your communication? Who is the most important person you communicate with daily? Ourselves. It's exactly right. Ourselves. 
Now, here's the question. Why are you the most important person to communicate with Bailey? Why? Because we need to understand ourselves first. You need to understand yourself first. And doesn't your communication color your whole world? Don't you see the world because of what's going on in your head? Mm -hmm. And do you know how many... Oh, by the way, don't worry about writing this down. Everything that I talk about is in the book. Okay. Now, I, I want you to take your book out, and I want you to rub it like this, and say, it's in the book. <laughs> Don't worry, you will not lose it. Yes. Okay. Why won't you lose it? It's in the book. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, what am I getting you to do? I'm getting you to do something uncomfortable. <laughs> so periodically today, I'm going to say, well, look, what does this mean? <laughs> okay, so... We talk to ourselves at 600 to 1,200 words per minute. That's a lot of data. And guess what? It's often repetitious, and it's stereotypical. And you know what I mean by stereotype. You look at someone that's stressed poor, and you say, oh, they're, they're probably got less intelligence, they're probably lazy, and it's all because of their, we, we start that conversation in, the, in our head. Me, I am a nurse, and I still practice, I work in the recovery room. And I brought a patient out of surgery. The patient, 99% of the time, is still asleep. And the nurse anesthetist, or the circulating nurse, They'll bring me the, the patient, and while I'm hooking them up, the blood pressure and all of this other stuff, it's it. This patient, or they're being crazy, mm -hmm. or this little girl's mother, oh my God, is she controlling? She is high maintenance. Mm -hmm. Or this is a daddy's girl. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I'm not you when you bring dad <laughs> back. So what is that doing to my... It's starting to influence my talk. And I have to, and you as physicians, you will be encountered by nurses that say, Here, here's the chart, and oh, I am so glad I didn't go to medical school because this family is <laughs> off the charts. Here's the chart. <laughs> that kind of, whoa, am I going to, I got to deal with a crazy person. So I fight that. How do I fight that? I change that inner dialogue, and I talk to myself, okay, this job to me, and to that nurse anesthetist and that circulating nurse, this is Monday through Friday, this is the same thing, this is so comfortable for us, but for that patient, they don't know me, they're not even in underwear, and they got that stupid ugly gown on, so they have no underwear on, they're practically undressed, I am a stranger, they have been poked and prodded and very sharp things stuck in their body. Total trust. And they're not supposed to act a little different? If they think this is normal, I would worry about them. They're out of their comfort zone. They're going to be nervous. They're going to be stressed. We're going to talk about that later on, how this affects your personality style. And it comes out in ways that are not normal for human interaction. The family, when I have a child, let, let's say a tonsillectomy or something like that, and I'll get them back there and I'll get them hooked up and I, and I will hear the information I don't want to hear. Mom, mother is, oh my word, she is terrible. God help you, Darren, when she gets back here. I, you know how I offset it? As soon as that patient wakes up and has got a good airway, I usually ask the nurse, um, Jane just woke up, she's breathing on her own, everything's fine, I will be back in less than a minute. And I will walk out to the waiting room. Uh, Jane Sullivan's family, and the mother and father will pop up. And, and the first words out of my mouth is, I've had Jane about 15 minutes, she is doing great, her vital signs are excellent. I am a parent too, I'm bringing you back early. What did I tell them? In, in another sense, what did I tell them? Your child's own kid? Their, their own kid, and I'm bringing them back early. What does that make them feel? Privileged. Privileged, yes. 
Whose side are they on already? Yeah, Mine! Because <laughs> I'm treating them special. I didn't even tell them my name or anything. I made it all about them. I made it all about their daughter or son. I made it, and, and I told them, you're special. I'm bringing you back early. And I usually do with a parent, because while we're walking back, and I also tell them this, I'll say, especially with children, waking up from anesthesia, they start crying. It might be, and we're walking along, it, and I'll be looking at the mother and the father, it might be because of pain, but about 20% of the population, they wake up from anesthesia and they start crying for no reason. So when she wakes up fully, and if she starts crying, don't panic, because if it's pain, I have the pain medicine. So I'm very, being very specific, I'm painting different scenarios so that when they get to the bedside, they do not become crazy when their daughter wakes up and just starts screaming because they're already prepared for it. I prepared them. But once again, I put them first. I made them feel special. I told them I was bringing them back early. I told them their daughter was doing excellent. Their vital signs are excellent. All that stuff before I said, my name is Darren Murphy. Because do they really care who I am at that moment? No. You guys are really smart. You're going to do very, very well as physicians because it's not about us. It's about them. Isn't that cool? Yeah. When you do it that way and you do it on purpose and you, no matter what negative things are coming in, you've already got a monologue that you're telling yourself. Of course they're going to act different. They're out of their safety zone. And sometimes... I will say when the patient wakes up and their wife is there or husband's there and all that and they start talking and then they'll, they'll say, they'll turn and they'll look to me and they'll say, um, I noticed my blood pressure is kind of high. And it might be a little bit high. If it was dangerously high, I would, I would be doing something about it. But they'll say, my blood pressure is usually 110 over 60 and here I am 145 over 98. And I said, it is not high. You, you don't even have underwear on. Do you know me? You've had very sharp objects poked in your body. If all that was done to me today, my blood pressure would be higher than that. <laughs> See, I've addressed it. I didn't say, no, it isn't high so much. It's high, yes, but it's not dangerous. And this is the reason why. So you always think about them uh, as opposed to, no, it's not high. Now, I want to go with discharge. No, 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 no. They're still thinking about that. I was working at a hospital once where they wanted the recovery room nurse, while the patient was still in surgery, go out to the waiting room and give discharge instructions to the family. I refused to do it. See, I'm old. I can refuse things now. When I was young, a new nurse, a net nurse in training, I was, oh, okay. But now I'm so old and I've done it for 35 years, I said, no, I'm not doing that. And they know, to, why aren't you going to do that? It, it'll save time. I said, no, 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 no. Until they see that family member breathing, talking, acting normal, they ain't processing any information. They went back shortly thereafter because their patient satisfaction scores, because so many other people started doing that, d d uh, discharge instructions out in the waiting room, their patient satisfaction scores dropped. Mine didn't. Okay, how do people interpret your, um, in, uh, how you communicate? We've covered how the most important person you communicate with daily. Now, I want to go and do impact. What is the most important part of your communication? I'm going to act something out, and when I come, I'm going to go out that door, and then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to be doing some actions, and I want from anybody to tell me what I am communicating to you.
Frustration. Anger. Okay. <coughs> Next. Anxious. Anxious. Did, <laughs> did I say anything? No. This is... Oh. <laughs> Dr. Albert Moravian first was an engineer, so data, 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 and then he became a psychologist. He got his doctorate in psychology. So he did data collection. What is the biggest impact of your communication when you're talking, when you're looking, when you're doing all that? 55% is just how you look and how you move. No words. Nothing said. Nothing said. 55. So the big impact, when you walk in that patient's room and you're like this, what? What are you communicating like this? Insecurity. Yeah, because of you're all closed off. Mm -hmm. So, you've always got to remember, not even saying a word, you're, you're communicating. Now, if I started this lecture and I was talking to you this way, in a monotone, in a stern, in loud voice. I am sure each and every one of you would have a bladder issue and need to go to the bathroom <laughs> and never return. 38% <laughs> of the impact of your communication is in how your voice sounds. So they're looking at you. It's in the book. <laughs> they're looking at you, and then they're hearing how you sound. And then finally, the actual content of the words, 7%. So, uh, for example, when you are giving bad, in America, when you have a hospital negative event, and what happens in America more than in any other country when something goes wrong in healthcare? Lawsuit. So, and they're always listening to what you use. So, 7%, even though it's the smallest impact of your communication, it is still important. So, let's say you have an adverse event. Do you say, we are going to investigate what went wrong? Investigate gives the impression that we were responsible for something going wrong. There could have been anything. That person could have been a walking heart attack. Yeah. And here they came in for a liver biopsy and had an MI. Yeah. Not even connected. So on the 7%, you have to start thinking about the words that you <coughs> use. And the words that, when I teach this class to doctors and nurses, the words that we'll use is, we are going to review all the steps that were done. And then I go on to say also, and we are going to keep you updated no later than 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. We will be in touch with you, telling you. And then I also go on and say, is there anything that I can do for you right now? Do you need some phone calls? Do you need, uh, when was the last time you ate? You look kind of pale. You know, I will be addressing them on very specifics. So, this is so important. The most, um, look, be aware of how you look, how you sound, and what you say. Mm -hmm. And it's covered very, very specifically. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so, um, how do you make a person feel comfortable? <laughs> and that goes together with the next one. Six most powerful questions. I've got this from Rudyard Kipling, who is a journalist. And he called them his six honest serving men as a journalist. 
And they are, and once again, it's in the book, don't write it down. Be with me in the moment. <laughs> Who, what, where, how, when, and why. When two people meet for the first time, you kind of don't know, except after this class, you're going to know exactly what to say. You kind of don't know what to say. But when you start thinking, and it's a process, who, what, where, how, when, and why. Hi, my name is Darren. Oh, Diana. Diana, where are you from, Diana? I'm from Ghana. Ghana. How long have you been in Ukraine? Oh, well, two years. And uh, so that means you're a third year medical student? Fourth year. Fourth year. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any family at home? Sure. <laughs> they are. Oh, my mom, my dad, and my younger brother. Do you get to go home often, or do you have to stay here during break? I have to stay here, but I go after two years. After two years? Yes. Are you able to contact them daily or weekly? Um, twice a month. Do you have any siblings? Yes, I have one brother. One brother. Yes. Does she feel like I'm interested? Yes. yes. And it's all in the 55, 38, and the 7% who, what, where, how, when, and why. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with patients, if you automatically go to that mode, you are going to open up doors of communication with that patient mm -hmm. that no other doctor, unless they get to my workshop, will be able to do. <laughs> and another thing, the other doctor won't have what? The book. The book. <laughs> so you see how this is starting to work together? See, I am talking to you as scientists, because if I just told you to do this, 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 and this, you'd, yeah, okay, and you'd leave in nothing. You guys, I'm from New England, and we say you guys. You guys, it's a total girl guy thing, uh, depend on data, application, variable, data, application, variable. And that's what this, I've designed this course for you so that you feel, you feel comfortable in the way that I'm teaching it. See, I'm giving you layers, and then later on we get to practice them. That's the really fun part. Okay, so we've covered the six most powerful questions. The next one I'm going to spend more time with. This is so much fun. And I usually, when I've got longer time, and I don't have long time here, I've taken a six-hour workshop, and I had to cut it down to 90 minutes. So when I usually interact, I think I might even have less than 90 minutes today. <laughs> when I usually interact, I show this to you. You already know this. What I'm going to share with you right now, you already know this. I, I truly mean this. You just don't know that you know it. So what we're going to do right now is this is the four universal personality styles. And by the way, what right do I have to talk to so many different cultures about something universal? You are scientists. So, these things that are stapled, this is the data. I'm only sharing with you universal communication skills. They're non-cultural. They're non-country. They're surely not any like your family. If you come from a family like me, like all families, we put fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> so anyways, this is what I'm sharing with you, and this is the data, because you're a science, scientist, you're not going to take my word for it. I got the data. It's up here. Anyhow, we're going to do the four universal personality styles, and it's a very specific grid, and guess where it's also at? Right. Okay. A director, just by virtue of the name, is the director his or her, this is, no, no gender is involved. They're a direct, my mother was a director. I come from what is called in the sociological, anthropological terms, a matriarchal family. Mm -hmm. My father didn't know that. My mother was very smart. My father thought he was in charge. <laughs> you get my meaning? <laughs> But it was my mother. That's how I, as a male, am able to work with other nurses. Because there's a whole few ma males in nursing. And when I went into nursing, there were very few males. And that was back in 1985. 
and I was in school from 82 to 84. So anyways, I, I learned how to work because I watch, I watch a lot. Director type personality is his or her door, office, open or closed? Closed. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have an appointment and you've got 10 minutes and you're, you're going through and that director is asking you questions and, and I want you to be more specific, Darren. Give me that data again. And because the director is asking questions and you know you're going to run over the 10 minutes, what do you think would be a real smart thing to do with a director type personality? I would say, you gave me 10 minutes to talk with you this meeting. You've asked me some really good questions. I'm so glad that tells me you're interested. But we're going to run over. Should I make another appointment or do you want me to continue? What am I doing by saying that? He's in charge. I'm putting the direction of the meeting in her or his hand. And what does that communicate to him or her? You are like me. <laughs> and what do people like? People who are like themselves. Isn't that neat? See, you knew that. You already knew that. You just didn't know you knew that. Okay. Opposite the director is the relator. Just by the name, to, to relate to somebody to really want to understand that other person. Just by the name, is his or her door open or closed? Open. open. Do you have to make an appointment? No. What is on every relator's desk or credenza? Books. What else? Candy. Pictures. I want you to, when I'm going through this, I want you in your mind, don't think in the abstract. I want you to, oh, Darren's describing my biology teacher. Or Darren's describing my sociology teacher. Oh my, yeah. I want you to make this real. Don't think in the abstract. I want you to put a picture to these people. So a relator. Door open. Don't have to, you can just drop in. There's candy there. There's pictures. They might even have pictures of your kids if it's a small enough company. And there's always, always, always tissue. Yes. Ah, you've seen that, haven't you? <laughs> See, I told you you knew this. So, if you were to talk to a relator, and it was only about the data, or the goal, or whatever this one or another one would want to know, what would that relator, if you're only talking about that stuff, what would that relator think about you? <coughs> Different. You're, you're shaking your head. You won't be communicating. But if you open it up and you know they're a relator, because you, you look at the environment, you look at how they respond to your communication, you know that, how is your family? I haven't seen you since last week. I heard you were going on vacation. Did you have a good time? You make it about what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. See, a director sees life from this viewpoint. A relator sees life from this viewpoint. That's why they're very specifically on that grid. They're opposite. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them right or wrong. It just makes them, they see life in a different way. Socializer. Door open or closed? Open. Are they there? No. No, they're out socializing. <laughs> Who do they want to talk about? Everybody. Do you know I went on vacation last week? I went to the Swiss Alps. Oh man, I had such a big time. I went snowboarding and I met this. Oh, this girl that, oh, just took my heart up. It's all about that him. Mm -hmm. All in big picture, big item. <coughs> Thinker. 
Door open or close? Close. You give them data and they, they process that data. What do they want next? More data. <laughs> they process that data. What do they want? More data. <laughs> you want something done right? Give it to a thinker. You want it done on time? Think again. You will meet, if, if the whole world were these guys, what would the world be like? Very boring, very strict, very bottom line. Any one of those, if there were every, everybody, life would not be good. This is the good mix. Now, important question, where am I? What is my dominant style? And after you tell me where I am, I'll tell you why I'm there. Relator. Pardon? Relator. Relator. What, any other guesses? <laughs> okay. I, we all, we, we see ourselves as socializers when it's called for. Yeah. Yeah. Relator when it's called for, thinker, and director. We usually operate right here, except when you're sick, tired, angry, afraid, or stressed out. You then go deeper and deeper and deeper into the area that is your dominant style. And how did it become your dominant style? That is how you made it to this point in life and you're still living. I came from a very strict family. Very strict. And I went to parochial school. Very strict again. So I grew up in a strict family. I went to a strict school. You know, when I went into the military, I just breezed through basic training because it was just like at home. <laughs> it was no big deal. I am a director personality. And I have to, when I'm sick, tired, angry, afraid, or stressed out, I have to consciously talk to myself and keep me up here. Every one of you physicians have a dominant style. Everyone that you meet will have a dominant style. The goal as a physician, when you're dealing with a director, you're going to give information like a director likes it. As opposed to when you're dealing with a relator. You're going to give information the way a relator likes it. You will even do uh, physical things, the 55%, differently. And we're going to uh, show you an example of that later on. Everything's different. One person you're going to maybe touch. The other person you do not touch unless that person allows themselves to be touched. But I am a director. Know that I hope that you started putting people's faces to this. So that you know already, you just didn't know you know it, you dealt with that person a little bit differently. And now you know why. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, and once again, <laughs> so, we've gone over the uh, personality styles, how to communicate bad news to patients and family. So, we are going to give you an example of a negative event. And uh, Ron's going to play the husband. And I'm going to be the doctor entering the room. His wife had been in a car wreck, and so we've had to put her in ICU. I want you to see how this whole interchange, look at it in a complete way. So, this is a door, and he has been in the quiet room. And I open up the door, and he's up walking around. 
which is telling me some information about which personality stop he is. Hi, my name is Darren. I'm the nurse in the emergency room. I took care sure. of your wife when she first came in. Okay. I'm sorry this has happened, this, this accident. This yes. is, well, tell me what's going on. She is in the intensive care unit. We have her on a bed. <coughs> that means it's a machine that's breathing for her. And the reason why, she can breathe on her own, but she has so many broken ribs, we're mechanically breathing for her. We're trying to prevent pneumonia. Your wife, everything that is wrong can be fixed. She is going to be in the ICU for a while. Is there anyone that I can call for you? Do you have any questions? Yes, I've been looking on the internet and, and, and looking at her symptoms, and this seems to be very serious, and the outcome it is. does not seem to be good. So I'm, I'm very <coughs> concerned here. And what you uh, saw on the who, internet? Who should I be talking to here about this? I'm going to have the doctor come in in a few minutes. He is with the patient at present. But I knew that you were in here, and I knew that you were just worried to death. Okay. So you're right. What you saw on the internet, it is serious. What am I doing? You're I'm affirming what he yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it is not that serious. Uh -huh. no, 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 no. Because if I said that to him, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You're right. It is serious. You, and we are. That's why we have her in the intensive care unit. It is so serious that we have her on a ventilator. But because she's in the intensive care unit, what am I doing? Because we're doing this, 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 the outcome is going to be positive. I'm going to get the doctor in here so that she can tell you more specifics. Can I get anything for you right now? No, I'm, I'm fine, but I appreciate it. Less than 10 minutes. Talking. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. What personality stop? You know, you leak through. <laughs> He's a, he is a director. Okay. Randall is a director. And the first group, he did director. And, and what he did, do director, I came in the room. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Darren. My name is Randy. Did he get up? No. No. Because no. he is in a position in his mind, I'm going to control this. But he, <laughs> when I came in, he was up walking around pacing. Remember about the socializer? I said, where's the socializer? Yeah. I, I, right. He's in a, in a room, so he, and he knows that he has to stay in this room to get information, but he's also going to use the entire room. <laughs> because that makes him feel comfortable. So you saw a little demonstration here. I'm willing to do a demonstration with somebody that is, uh, who wants to play doctor? Hold on a minute. <coughs> I don't read sign language. 20? Yes, please. Thank you. You'll be the doctor? I want to be the doctor. You're, you're going to be the doctor? Okay. And I will be, I, I'll, I'll do it first, and then I'm going to have two of you do it. But I'll, I'll be the patient. No, you're the doctor, I guess. <laughs> and use the same thing. My wife has been in a car wreck, and she's gone to the intensive care unit. She's on a respirator. The reason why. You want to change your mind now? You <laughs> want? I can't do it. Okay. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Not good. And I understand your situation, but I think hopefully everything will be fine. And now uh, the wife is under, uh, I think, intensive care unit, and then I think very soon she's going to be fine, so we should relax and everything will be okay. The one good thing he is doing, he is keeping eye contact with me. I do not like, I don't like throwaway phrases, meaning, how are you doing? <laughs> Please. <laughs> because you will never do that again. Mm -hmm. You will say, this must be very upsetting to you. Not, how are you doing? Because did you notice what I said imme immediately? Not good. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, oh, who is he? Meaning me. Yeah. <laughs> and what did I do after a while? You said what would be a really cool thing for him to do then? 
Yes, exactly right. 55%. And then, if I'm like this, he would be like this. And if he were to mirror me, then it would be, okay, I'm starting to feel like you're like me. Okay? Want to do it again? From, from, from scratch? And if someone, if he needs a chair, he might grab yours. <coughs> But he's going to come in and first sit, but there's a chair available for him. ICU, now she's in the operating room. Take it from there, because this is how it's going to happen. This is real life. Yes. am I displaying? Exactly. So, do I want to hear generalities? Yeah. And I want to hear time and, and things like this. So, when, when you read that person like that, and you will, you will, because you know what? You volunteered to be in a very hot seat. <laughs> That means you're serious about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else want to play doctor with me? Um, okay. Okay. Um, excuse me, Mr. Darren? Yes. Um, I'm the doctor in charge of your wife. Um, she, we're, she's under control right now. We're doing everything we can. She. She had um, trauma, a lot of fractures because of the fractures to her ribs. We put her on a ventilator. We're basically breathing for her. You're breathing for her? But she no, she's that's not a man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's on a machine that's breathing for her. And um, well, why, why did you have to put her on that machine? It's just to give her lungs a break because it's there are a lot of fractures. It's, she will be fine. It's. Nothing serious. We. It's not serious. It's serious, but. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to do fine because once again you're in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. You put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Mm -hmm. And remember, how often do you have to do this mm -hmm. before this is just totally comfortable? Mm -hmm. Just the fact that you volunteered, and so what all of you need to do is get a buddy and start practicing telling a family member the bad news, the adverse event. Because the more times you do it, it will become natural. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Anybody? Do we have any more time? Oh, yeah, okay. We're just observing. No. Okay. So, anybody else? I'm going to be. I'm going to display a certain um, personality style. Yes, me. Okay. Um, 
under control. Um, we'll have her under control. Um, <laughs> yes, she's fine. So, but mm-hmm. if she's fine, how come you have her under control? She's fine. <laughs> how is she fine? What? Oh wait, wait a minute. Let's just take a break. Mm-hmm. What personality style? Beta. Beta. Yes, Beta. exactly. Because I want. Right now she's in the ICU. Um, we'll How long will she be in ICU? Um, for another day. We'll have her out by tomorrow. So. What time tomorrow? Tomorrow by three. When will I know that? Um, we'll let you know by twelve. <laughs> <laughs> and what what will make that not happen? And you're in the hot seat. Be, be, you're uncomfortable. I know that. But the more times you do this, so once again, think your style. Da 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 da. How long? What will make that not happen? And and, and and you as a doctor, you'll be saying, if she were to get infection. And then simultaneously, you're going to say, but she's on a breathing machine to prevent pneumonia. And we're doing a prophylactic antibiotic to make sure she doesn't get it. Yes. And you're not, because I'm a thinker type personality at this point in time, and, and you've identified it because I started asking questions, you might say, Mr. Murphy, would you sit down and then you sit down? And then I'd explain. Yes. And then you would know that I want the details. Mm-hmm. And then my anxiety? Calm, calm, calm. Because she is what? Like me. She sees the world from my viewpoint. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be okay. Thank you so much for doing it. I mean, because this is a hot scene. Anybody else? Lander. <laughs> Yes. Hey, dear. <laughs> what real world? This is real. <coughs> Open the window. Yeah. It is the hot seat. Yeah. You need, you need that open. No, no. Um, because you weren't here when I described the personality styles. They, oh, they're they're interpreting. When they walk in, they're okay. seeing me. Sorry, I'm not here. Now we put her it was over. kind of serious. Okay, it was serious, but ah, now, okay. but now she's. But it's not serious now. Yeah, it's okay. She's oh been. Do you mind sitting down like this? I don't want to sit down. <laughs> you want to sit down? No, I think you need to sit down. Sit down. And what this doctor is trying to do, she thinks I'm escalating. But what I'm doing, well, by the way, what, what personality style? Socializing. Socializing. And she mistakenly thought I was going to start going overboard. But what I was doing was, I was feeling good because, okay, she, and she, you just misinterpreted my socializer thing because I wasn't going to start going overboard. I was, you were speaking words like, and I was saying, oh, okay, okay. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> you talked to me last night about MPH, and we got along so well, and now you won't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to try. Are they, are they volunteering you? <laughs> I don't want to put anyone in the hot hot seat, but I'm going to tell you this. The ones that got up here and did it, they are a f- miles ahead of the ones that haven't because they've already done this. And now they will pick a partner, and it will probably be each other, and they're going to do this so often that then when you are an intern working in an emergency room and they're looking for someone, uh, who wants to go talk to the family? <laughs> 
so that you will know exactly what to do. If Randall all of a sudden fell on that table, what would you do? What would you check for first? Response. And you get no response. What do you check for next? Breathing. Airway. Is it blocked? And then it's not blocked. Now you're checking for breathing. And then circulation, which is pulse. I kind of put you on the hot seat there. I know you guys know that because I went from touchy feely medicine, yeah. airway, breathing, circulation. After response, you knew exactly what to do. You didn't know what to do with touchy feely, especially with someone that might be from another country, another culture, another gender, the opposite gender of whoever you are. But the more you train, then you will be able to do like the doctors you are. You already know how to do it health-wise. Now you will be able to do it emotion-wise. Remember, the human being is four parts. Mind, body, spirit, emotions. And as physicians, when you put them all together, you will consistently be always thought of as, I want you for my doctor. I want you to take care of my family because you are a physician. Now, there is a test. Didn't know there was a test, did you? No. Are you anxious now? No. Excited. Excited. <laughs> the test isn't about you. It's about if I did good. Because the goal of this whole course was how to give bad news to a patient and family. I tried to build it so it made sense, and then we tried to practice. I want you to fill out, and I want truth so that I can make this better. So take your time and fill this out, please. Does everyone have one? Don't put your name, but put on the fact that you're in medical school, and I would like to put, would like to put what year medical school, and in the top left-hand corner, all of you put the number two, because I already took group number one, and I hope group number two is better. <laughs> Take your time to fill that out, please. What you want to be. And for medical school, we write the year? Or? Plus, year, yes, plus the fact that you're going to Nevada Francis oh. University. I hope to read about this university in a few years that is sending doctors all over the world in countries want you from here. 
so that then I can brag and say, I have evaluations from this <laughs> university. If you would give them to Randall, he'll pick them up. And up here, I have one of my favorite Indian poets. I, I got a copy for each one of you of a poem that he wrote. And a Christian prayer that is very little known. And I think it encompasses Christianity all in one prayer. So you don't have to take them. The stapled stuff is the data, the, the data that I use to prove that it's cross-cultural. So this is for you, or this is for you, but those are for you to look at if you were interested. I have up here a, one, a poem from one of my favorite Indian poets, and I have a prayer up there. Okay, you don't have to buy it. I'm a director. <laughs> gift to you and thank you for volunteering. You. It's very hard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.